So here we are. This is actually the last talk on the main stage of the ZK6. And I'm so happy to invite Brian Gu and Alan Luo. Uh, they're gonna be talking, they're both from ZK Game. I think they're pretty well known in this community. They're gonna be talking about ZK Snarks for hidden information blockchain games. So take it away. Awesome. Well, thanks for having us, Anna. And uh, we're really happy to be here and, and to share some new Snark constructions we've been working on. Um, so first off, I guess by way of introduction, uh, I'm Brian. I am. Uh, I work a little bit with the Ethereum Foundation, and I also work on Dark Force uh, and other ZK games. Um, and I am currently on leave from a math degree at MIT. Yeah, and I'm Alan. I've just been working with Brian on Dark Force and other ZK games, and I'm also on leave from studying CS. <clears throat> cool. So um, just to get started here, um, to give some quick motivation before uh, today we're going to be discussing a couple of ZK constructions. Um, we're first going to dive into uh, why are ZK snarks useful for blockchain gaming. I think a lot of people here are really familiar with um, you know the applications of ZK snarks for privacy technology or scalability technology, with things like um, you know various roll-up solutions and anonymity solutions. Um, but the thing that uh, one thing that we're really excited about is to see the use of ZK snarks um, for uh, decentralized games. <clears throat> So to start off with some motivation, um, in order to understand why ZK Snarks are useful, it's important to understand the distinction between the two types of games, complete and incomplete information games. Complete information games are games like uh, chess or checkers, where basically everybody at all times knows the full state of the world. So in chess, I know where your pieces are, you know where my pieces are, and there's no secrets. Uh, on the other hand, incomplete information games encompass all games where there's some notion of private or hidden state and where players might not at any given time know the full state of the world. So for example, poker is a hidden information game because I don't know what your cards are, you don't know what my cards are. Uh, similarly, a lot of strategy games like StarCraft uh, are incomplete information games as well. Uh, and it's generally the case that um, pretty much all of the most popular online multiplayer games are uh, have some component of hidden information, um, simply because that extra primitive of information being a, a first class resource um, allows for a very rich, sort of space of social dynamics or you know, strategies to evolve. Um, and that's sort of uh, you know, what we're interested in exploring with CK Snarks. <clears throat> so up until this point, because of the nature of blockchains and other decentralized systems, um, it's almost not been possible to really build incomplete information games on blockchains. The reason for this is that blockchains by design are systems where you know, the data layer uh, is often going to be like completely open or transparent. Obviously, you know, with some exceptions around blockchains that are specifically built around privacy, um, but you know, anybody can inspect the full state of any contract on the EVM at any time. <clears throat> what this means is that, uh, you know, without zk snarks, if we want to build, if previously we wanted to build blockchain games, we were sort of limited to the complete information games regime. Uh, you know, so this means that we can build games like Crypto Kitties or trading card games, where everybody knows who owns what kitty and what all the properties of each kitty are. Um, but you know we can't really lean into those more complex like social dynamics or strategy spaces that hidden information uh, is going to enable. So you know our kind of theory here is that up until zk snarks make hidden information possible, we're sort of at like the tic tac toe level of blockchain gaming, and you know there's obviously so much more that we can do here. <clears throat> uh, so one specific example of you know, a game where information asymmetry is really critical um, is the genre of real-time strategy games, where there's the notion of like a fog of war. So in these games, until I have explored the entirety of the map that we're both playing on, I might not know where your base is, you might not know where my base is, I don't know what units or buildings you're constructing and, and vice versa. Um, and this leads to a lot of really interesting sort of feints and deception and, and this sort of thing. <clears throat> Many of you might also be familiar with games like um, you know, EVE Online, these really big persistent MMO games, um, whether they're, you know, persistent strategy games or RPG games, uh, and EVE Online and, and games in this genre sort of have a very rich history about, like, uh, players can engage in conditional coordination, deception, um, emergent dynamics. Um, all of these things are made possible with information asymmetry. <clears throat> and finally, uh, you know, in a large class of games, in fact, like most multiplayer online games, there are some elements where privacy is sort of taken as a given. Um, so, you know, I sort of, I have an expectation of privacy in an RPG game like World of Warcraft or, you know, RuneScape, where I basically just expect that my possessions and my bank account and my inventory is, you know, it's not exposed to the whole world to see. So 
Um, here, it's not even like th this is something that I just sort of take for granted and, and expect as a given. Um, and I would it, it would be a little strange if there was a game such that like you could inspect other players bank accounts. Um, so obviously, all these mechanics that we've just described are tricky to do in blockchains because of the nature of you know blockchain as a data layer is, is open and transparent. Um, but fortunately, with ZK Snarks, which you know, as many people know, became viable for a lot of production applications uh, in the last two years, <clears throat> we can now actually uh, impose a meaningful notion of hidden information on the blockchain. So the way that we're going to do this is, you know, suppose we have a game where uh, a player wants to keep some state private. So let's say that they have some private state S1, their inventory or their card hand or whatever else that they want to keep hidden from the network, but they still want to be able to Adhere, adhere to the rules of the game provably in you know moving around and, and taking actions. So our construction here is you know we're the, the high level idea is that instead of committing their private state up to the to the network, they're going to commit a you know hash or a commitment to their private state, uh, along with a zero knowledge proof that that does indeed correspond to a validly formed private state. So this proves that like I'm not giving myself extra resources in my card hand or you know anything like that. Now, whenever a player wants to make a state transition, <clears throat> what they're going to do is they're going to upload the commitment to their new private state. So, you know, a hash of like the object, the structured object of their private state, uh, and a zero knowledge proof that there is a valid state transition from you know the first uh, private state to the second private state. So, this proof basically says something like, um, "I'm going to move my knight from secret location A to secret location B. I'm not going to tell you what either of these locations are." Um, however, this proof proves that I did move the knight in a valid L shape and I didn't cheat by like teleporting it across the map. Uh, and using this construction, we're basically able to, um, or using this high level idea, we're able to sort of engage in a much richer and more dynamic space of games that can be built on decentralized systems. <coughs> um, so now what me and Alan are going to do is we're going to talk through three constructions um, of uh, basically using ZK Starks for game mechanics. Um, in some previous talks, we've discussed uh, you know, one or two of them, um, but there's a third one, card drawing, which we haven't talked about before. And we also, at the end of this presentation, um, will be demoing a game that we've been building with some of these mechanics. Um, it's a small kind of proof of concept turn-based strategy game. Uh, and you know, the, uh, one of the exciting things uh, that we have lined up for you guys is in the Gather Town after party, after this session, um, there's a little Easter egg in the Gather Room where if you go to um, if you find like a certain entrance, um, then you'll actually be able to play this game for yourself as well <clears throat> with the other participants in the after party. Um, cool. So the first construction uh, that many of you might be familiar with is you know the idea of the cryptographic fog of war. Uh, as we mentioned, a fog of war is basically a mechanic in a lot of strategy games which prevents players from having vision of what each other is doing until they've you know explored an area or like discovered the opponent's base or things like that. Um, <clears throat> this is Hard to do in a decent, decentralized setting, of course, because um, you know if I'm just straight up uploading my location or my coordinates to a smart contract, then then that ought to be inspectable to you. So, you know, our game Dark Forest uh, uses a cryptographic fog of war, where we essentially enforce location hiding with ZK Snarks. So essentially, players are going to initialize into this you know large infinite world, and rather than uploading their coordinates you know, X, Y directly to the blockchain, they're going to upload hashes or commitments to their coordinates along with zero knowledge proofs. Um, whenever you want to move between two locations in Dark Forest, you're going to upload a proof that, uh, you know, like we said with the example uh, of like the secret night previously, um, you're going to submit a proof that basically says, I'm sending forces from A to B. I'm not going to tell you where A and B are, but the zero knowledge proof proves that this was a valid move. <coughs> Um, an interesting corollary of this is that in order to explore the universe, uh, you actually have to do something akin to proof of work. So, you know, suppose that I initialize at coordinates five comma twenty, and Alan initializes at three comma eight in some world. We both upload hashes of our respective locations to the blockchain, and to anybody inspecting the network and to each other, these basically look like gibberish. However, if I want to find points of interest that are close to me, what I have to do is I just the best thing I can do is start brute forcing. Uh, computing hashes close to me. So, you know, I'll hash like 6, 20 and 4, 21, 5, 19. And, you know, eventually if I do this enough, I'm going to get to 3, 8. And when I hash 3, 8, um, I'm going to get some string and I'll be able to look on the blockchain and be like, oh, Alan has already committed to and uploaded this string. So now I know that Alan is this specific distance away from me. Um, you know, and, and this mechanic in Dark Forest is basically uh, in order to explore space and find other players, 
you literally have to like mine space um, by setting your, your CPU to compute a bunch of hashes. Uh, for those who are a little bit more interested in the details, um, we have some versions of our circuits uh, in our you know, open source repo. Um, and the construction is basically uh, is more or less what you expect. You upload two hashes and a proof that the pre-images of these hashes are within a certain Euclidean distance of each other. <clears throat> um, yeah, so this is the core me mechanic behind Dark Forest, um, which I know some people have heard of. Uh, we've run two private beta rounds with 1K players total. Um, and just to demonstrate like how important incomplete information is on a blockchain game, like just with this simple mechanic, um, we had players, uh, you know, just very excited about this game. Um, I think over the course of our playtest, we had about 200 billion gas used and saw about 250K transactions over the course of a week and broke both Rockspin and the XDI networks. So, um, yeah, super excited to explore this mechanic more. <clears throat> um, the second construction that we're going to be talking about is essentially using ZK Starks to do private random card drawing. So the central problem here is basically how can we draw cards in a way that is private uh, while also, um, you know, doing this in a trustless way. So um, first off, you know, if I want a game where I have a private card hand, uh, then there's the problem, which is basically like, how do I know that when you're drawing, you're not cheating and you're not like biasing somehow the, the like randomness that allows you to draw a card or you're not properly like integrating that card into your hand. Um, we basically like to be able to have private hands that we can trustlessly verify that, you know, each of us is committed to a valid hand. <clears throat> um, there's been a lot of thought put into this problem, uh, specifically using commit reveal sorts of techniques where basically, you know, I'll like pre-commit to the hash of a card that I'm drawing. And then later there's like some challenge period and, you know, Maybe I have to like reveal the card. Um, and uh, these, um, we're interested in using Snark for this problem, however, because the commit reveal schemes are often quite limited. Um, so there's a couple downsides to using commit reveal for card drawing. Um, one downside is that these schemes often require multiple back and forths. So like, you know, every time I draw a card or make some modification, I have to submit a pre-commit and then I have to submit a commit and then eventually there's a reveal and there's you know, multiple back and forths, which is really annoying when you're working with MetaMask and you have to like confirm every transaction. Um, the second limitation is that verifying the integrity of a long chain of commitments and private state transitions um, is annoying and it's going to scale with like the number of private state transitions you make. So if I make a bunch of pri private operations on my card hand and then eventually play a card, am I going to have to like upload the entire chain of, of hand state transitions? Um, and if so, that's uh, going to start being quite expensive. <clears throat> and the last thing is that commit reveal only works for uh, games that have hidden state but are eventually complete information. Um, so in a persistent universe like Dark Forest, uh, or you know, like un you can imagine an RPG, um, for a lot of uh, you know, like th there are going to be many cases where you might never reveal the information underlying your like planet's location or things like this. Um, and so commit reveal is not really going to be able to help you out in these sorts of paradigms. Commit reveal only is helpful in like you know regimes where in poker eventually there's a showdown and we, we have to show we have to choose to show our cards or else we fold. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're just going to present a quick construction for uh, how to draw and discard a little bit more conveniently using ZK Snarks. Um, so the idea here is that at any given time, I'm going to have a hand of, let's say, like three cards, uh, say blue, red, and green in this example. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to commit myself to these three cards by uploading the hash of them up to the blockchain. <clears throat> so suppose that I want to draw a card, um, and I want to, like, draw a card, integrate it into my hand, and then, you know, like replace and discard one of the cards that's already in my hand. How do we do this in zero knowledge without having to do a, a commit reveal scheme that goes back and forth a bunch? So the first sub problem here is how do we randomly generate a drawn card um, in a way that's unbiasable by both me and the other players? Um, and the way that we're gonna do this is essentially we are going to uh, like integrate some randomness that the opponents provided at the end of their turn um, as well as a private seed that I've pre-committed to at the start of the game. Uh, and we're going to hash those together to get our drawn card. And what we're going to do is rather than doing some sort of like pre-commit and reveal scheme, we're going to prove that we've done this properly with the correct private seed inside of a zero knowledge proof. So we're basically able to say like, hey, here's like essentially the hash of a drawn card. And here's a zero knowledge proof that uh, this card was indeed the hash of you know, my private seed that I've pre-committed to that you don't know, 
um, as well as some like public randomness that you've provided me. So this is sort of like a, a Randau like uh, uh, strategy here. <clears throat> Once we've drawn a card, uh, what we eventually want to end up with is we want to end up with a new hand where two of the cards in this hand are the same as two of the cards in my previous hand, and the third card is the drawn card swapped out for one of my three cards. Um, so essentially what we want to be doing is we want to take these four cards, you know, my three initial cards and my drawn card, and we want to permute them, um, and we want to get out, you know, three cards that I'm going to keep as my new hand and one discarded card. <clears throat> so um, how are we going to do this? Well, essentially what this reduces down to is we need to have a ZK snark for permutations. Um, so we need to be able to prove inside of a ZK snark that these four cards, uh, these two sets of four cards are indeed a permutation of each other. <clears throat> um, and so how are we going to do that? Uh, well, the basic idea here is that, um, you know, one thing that we can do fairly efficiently inside of a snark is we can constrain symmetric polynomials and the A sub I and the B sub I to be equal. So, you know, if we want a snark that proves um, these a sub i and these b sub i are, are indeed the same set. I can constrain their sums to be equal, uh, the sums of their pairwise products to be equal, and their product to be equal. Um, <clears throat> and this is equivalent to showing that the two polynomials with roots uh, a sub i and b sub i are identical, which is going to give us that these are indeed a permutation. Um, so we like this construction a lot. We think it's quite cute. Um, and you know, there's improvements that you can make here as well. Uh, so like the symmetric sums thing takes, you know, requires like exponential number of constraints in the number of cards that you're essentially trying to make these proofs on. Um, but you can evaluate the polynomial at a point and do like a fiat Shamir thing um, to, to pick the point that you're evaluating at um, in order to essentially prove permutations in linear number of constraints, <clears throat> which uh, is super useful. So now that we have this permutation snark, we can combine it with that like kind of random out technique uh, to essentially get private random card drawing. Um, and that is one of the mechanics that actually our um, demo game that we're going to be showcasing later involves. Um, and we think that you know this is a really interesting mechanic to us because it really opens up a lot of potential applications. Like the most obvious one is um, you know now with this kind of primitive, we can build card games like you know a, de a truly decentralized Hearthstone or other TCGs and CCGs. <clears throat> um, you know, you, basically you take your deck and you take your hand and you, you sort of roll them up into a snark. Um, and then you know, like we discussed before. Uh, people have an expectation of privacy around their inventories in a lot of MMO games. Um, and with this construction, we can do a similar sort of thing with, with RPG inventory. So, you know, I'm carrying around some swords and stuff, um, or some runes, and rather than committing all of those uh, item IDs up to the blockchain, I'm going to commit zero knowledge proofs. Um, and whenever I make state transitions, like I swap out a sword or something, or I craft two items together, um, I'm going to submit zero knowledge proofs that my inventory has been uh, honestly altered. Um, so yeah, we'll be we'll be showing an example of this uh, in our game that Alan's going to show uh, at the end of the presentation. Yeah. So the last construction that I'm going to talk a bit about is uh, trying to generate random and infinite meaningful worlds in Snarks. So the kind of motivation here is that like there's been a wave of games in recent years of Minecraft being the most famous example, where we generate these like infinite sandboxes that worlds can interact with and <coughs> create in. And kind of the key here is that rather than defining the bounds of the world explicitly, the world is generated as you go. So you define a simple set of rules that allows you to essentially generate like just infinite landscapes. And um, this doesn't mean that there's like no sense of content that we put into the game. It's not entirely random because I still know that like, oh, well, there's like oceans and there's hills and there's deserts and there's tundras and they interact in these meaningful ways. And I expect that I don't find like a desert next to a tundra and all these other things. Um, so it means that we can generate these like infinite and meaningful worlds. So the most important algorithm and also the most famous that's used in these games is Perlin noise. And uh, kind of the cool thing about Perlin noise is that it's basically all multiplication and addition. So it's really easy to put into a snark. Um, and basically the like the the contract that Perlin noise makes is that it's going to give you something which like on a local scale is smooth, but globally it's kind of random. And this is exactly the, the, the this is basically the property that we need in order to make really good, per, um, in order to generate very large, meaningful worlds. So uh, because it's very easy to put this in a snark, we can kind of uh, use Perlin noise as a kind of roll up. So for example, the problem, if you, if, if you imagine trying to build uh, Minecraft on the blockchain naively, well, you can try to store the entire world on a chain, but this is just not possible because the world's infinite and you're ready, you're, you're, and you're very con um, constrained in terms of storage. 
So Minecraft world is like hundreds of blocks tall and it's infinite blocks in any direction. The other thing you could try to do is you could try to uh, store the, you, you could try to put the Perlin algorithm on, on, uh, on chain. So you could try to make it so that whenever you like explore a new tile, then the, the contract itself is going to generate the tile that's there. But this is also really, really expensive because you're constrained by compute. So by putting uh, the world generation into a snark, we're neither constrained by uh, compute nor by the storage because once the snark is uploaded, then you have a commitment that you're able to use a constant proving time. And every time you want to interact with a new tile, all you need to do is go through that constant proving time. So this is actually what we did in the last round of Dark Forest, and this happens on two levels. First of all, um, it's already the case that we only need to store the planets that exist, so we don't need to, like, if a tile does not have a planet, it just like doesn't exist on the contract at all. And it's also the case that we don't need to compute the Perlin, um, the Perlin values of each planet in the on, on the contract because we can we can we can compute them off chain and just store whether or not this planet is like in deep space and has more rare resources or something. So as an example of how this might work, suppose we have this like infinite world here, and just to give a visual for the kind of thing that. Uh, that ZK unlocks here. Suppose that the player only wants to interact with a small number of points of interest. Well, this means that like they're able to see and generate the entire world, but only the points of interest act actually exist on the contract. So here, this is um, visualized with these red squares, and you can see that like only a tiny fraction of the world actually needs to be stored on chain. So suppose that the player only needs to interact with like one in every ten thousand squares. This means that we're able to essentially like cut our computation by ten thousand times. So between these three constructions, um, with like especially with like private state and uh, and with the Perlin noise, we think that because these mechanics are so central to building large, meaningful social interactions, uh, especially in modern gaming, um, this this is going to allow us to use zk to unlock meaningful dynamics, and more importantly, it's also going to let us uh, bring blockchain gaming to the mainstream. Cool. So before we move on to our quick uh, game demo. And before we show people how to get to that and, and gather, um, if you're interested in following uh, our progress on Dark Forest and other ZK games, you can follow us at darkforest underscore ETH on Twitter. Uh, we also keep a blog where we post like ZK and gaming related content at blog.zkga.me. And we have a Telegram group for general discussion at ZK underscore forest. Um, so yeah, now what we're going to do is we're going to shift gears and do a quick demo in the next like two, three minutes of... Uh, the game that we have built using ZK Snarks uh, and private card drawing and private locations. So uh, for ETH Online and for this conference, we put together a game called Boat Fight, which is ZK Naval Warfare. Um, and what we're going to do here is uh, we've basically set up a space in the gather after party where um, if you walk down to the ocean and you find like the secret portal squares, um, you can enter a space where you can you can also play this game as well. <clears throat> so, uh, I guess me and Alan will just go ahead and, and do a quick demo of how Boat Fight works and what ZK Snarks are actually doing here. So, right now, um, you know, this is the Boat Fight landing page. If you want instructions, you can, you know, click the Help tab. Uh, and, like, as far as, um, you know, if you want to inspect any of the transactions that are actually going on where Snarks are being submitted up to the XDAI chain, you can, you know, look here as well. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to join this game as Alice, and then... I'm going to join this game as Bob. Yeah. Oh, did you just... You might run into the race condition. Wait, that was funny. Oh, okay, here we go. All right. So I just joined the game as Alice, and Bob is joining the game as well. Yeah, and it's running on, as with all things blockchain, it might take a little bit of time to load. Actually, let me do a refresh because I think it might have the game ID problem here. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, Boat Fight is basically a two player turn based strategy game where uh, your objective is to destroy the opposing player's boat, uh, which is located at the opposite edge of the map. The map is a very simple, you know, five by seven tiled grid. Um, and the way that you're going to do that is basically uh, by playing ships onto the board. Cool. So uh, every turn, what I can do is I can place some number of ships onto the board. I can move my ships around, and I can use them to attack enemy ships. 
Uh, the catch here is that some of the ships are cloaked and they move around in zero knowledge. So for example, the submarine is a unit uh, that essentially like travels on, uh, underwater, um, is committed to the blockchain, uh, like its location is committed to the blockchain, uh, but not actually known by the other player. And uh, the other player is basically just like not going to see where my submarine is. So I've just placed a boat down um, and I've ended my turn. Uh, oh. And so now it's Alan's turn. Uh, the other place where ZK Snarks are used in this game is essentially uh, we also have, besides ships, a card drawing mechanic. <clears throat> so uh, every turn, you're able to draw one card into your hand of three cards, just like we showed in the uh, example construction. And these cards do things like, you know, deal X amount of damage to an opposing ship of my choice, or like heal my ship for some amount of, uh, um, you know, HP. Um, and the idea here is that basically, I do not know what Alan's hand is. Like, you know, he has no idea that I have this deal two damage card in my hand. I don't know what he has in his hand. Um, and what I'm going to be able to do is I'm going to be able to play these cards uh, and they're going to, that's going to be like a surprise to him because all of that stuff is happening inside of a ZK snark. So, you know, let's say I, you know, I'm going to attack with my missile. I'm going to move my ship and I'm going to end my turn. Um, and so, yeah, this is basically how gameplay works. Uh, you're going to summon ships. You're going to summon submarines. You play cards. Um, and over time, you're basically trying to get your opponent's boat down to zero HP. So uh, if you're curious about the game, again, check out the gather room. Um, walk towards the ocean at the south side of the map and like look for a secret portal square. Um, and we'll be hanging out in the room as well to sort of guide people through uh, playing ZK boat fight. Cool. So I think that's pretty much it. Cool. And if you want to come on. OK. Yeah. Well, so now, now you know our secret. We've been kind of working quietly on this part of the event. This is sort of to round it off. So I will share, I guess we'll share the link again to gather.town in the, in the chat. I do have an outro talk, but feel free to bounce whenever you want to. Um, and as Brian mentioned, the trick is you have to walk towards the ocean. So you maybe want to explore the map, get to know what that means, and then, yeah, walk into the sea to start trying this. Cool. All right. Um, yeah, I guess then I will shut this talk down, and I'll do a quick outro, and I will see you all running around uh, in Gather.Town. Thanks again, Brian and Alan. <laughs>